You know, we're all in remote locations today, um, but the show must go on, as they say. Commitment to the cause. <laughs> Andrew, a couple of weeks ago, you released, I think it was at the Brussels conference, the white paper around data, which for anyone that hasn't seen it, I just, you know, that in our industry, you've got to check out this white paper because it articulates so clearly the five layers of integration or the five ways from, you know, medium complexity to, well, complexity is probably not the correct term for it. It goes from simple integration to advance. Therefore, you get more value. The further along you go, you create a, a data landscape for your organization. So, Andrew, can you tell us a bit about your thinking around it? How did it come about? What was your, your and I assume, Anna, you've had a lot of input to it as well in that white paper? Yeah, so so the, the white paper is called Power Platform in a Modern Data Platform Architecture. And it's actually interesting. The I went back and I looked, um, and part of the reason that we titled it this way was that in early 2021, I published an essay. So it wasn't quite white paper length, and it was called Power Platform in a Modern Data Platform Architecture. And to this day, I mean, we're, um, you know, we're, we're years later, and that is by far the most popular visited search term thing um, that I've ever published on, on my blog. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to take the topic up again. And I think that one of the, a couple of the big challenges that organizations have when it comes to really scaling and using Power Platform across a big enterprise organization is always this challenge of, well, apps are only so useful if you're not able to use them with your organization's data, right? So, okay, where do we proceed from there? And this was something, there were sort of two parallel tracks. Anna and I have been working on this topic for about a year now, maybe a little longer, and we've been presenting at conferences. We presented the topic at Nordic Summit in Copenhagen last year, at Dynamics Minds, at Color Cloud, at European Power Platform Conference in Brussels. So, you know, we, we've, we've had a lot of opportunity to talk about this with folks out in the world and, and in the field who are doing this work um, and, and to really refine the, the model. So that's what the white paper does. The white paper goes into these five patterns of integration between Power Platform and the rest of your Azure data platform with a particular emphasis on, on Fabric. And it lays out these patterns, you know, from the, the more straightforward kind of the simple point to point using data connectors and virtual tables, which I think probably most people are familiar with, uh, all the way up to a quite sophisticated, how do you actually build Power Platform into the, I won't say Fabric, I'll say into the fibers of your data platform. And this has been a topic that that has really resonated just if you, you look at how many hundreds of people are overflowing out of the room when I present it. So I'm happy it's it's written down now in, in white paper form. And this goes further though than just the Microsoft ecosystem, right? Yes. It could be your, your HR system, it could be Workday, yeah. for example, it could be an SAP. Uh, you know, data estate. It's it's around bringing all the data sets together and mm. ultimately making them available in a format that's consumable, that's secure, that's repeatable, that's scalable as your organization develops new ideas, products, solutions, services internally for staff to use. Is that is that how you kind of you see it bringing all those data sets together. Yeah, and and there's a, I, I just looked this up because I wanted to 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 quote this. The quote from the introduction is: "For all the talk about Power Platform as a low code tool, and then I promise I would not use that phrase again because we're trying to move <laughs> away from low code, and I didn't in the rest of the paper. But for all the attention given to how supposedly easy easily it allows non technical users to create simple apps." Power Platform's greatest value lies not in the app, but in the data the app collects or serves back to its users. Simply put, yeah. Power Platform isn't an app phenomenon, it's a data phenomenon. And, you know, as I spend more and more of my workday nowadays helping organizations build 
big global data platforms, what I am finding is that it's very difficult to build a data platform today that reaches its full potential without also building power platform into that data platform. I think that that Dataverse is obviously the linchpin of this data that is application data that's collected inside of Dataverse is just one hop um, or one sort of technical push from Dataverse into one lake yeah. uh, or into a, a traditional Azure data lake, you know, Gen 2 storage. Um, and because of that, it Power Platform really solves, I think, the the last mile problem in your data platform, which is either, well, maybe the first mile, which is how do you get data in the platform? Mm -hmm. And then the last mile is how do you get data out of the platform and provide it to users in a way that is actually valuable and, 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 and useful. So Power Platform and Data Platform, I think, are inextricably linked at this point. Um, and that's really what you're doing is you're trying to bring these data sets together in a way that allow you to extract value from them. And, you know, you can do it without Power Platform, but it's way more expensive and way more time consuming. And I think way more fragile or rickety if you're you're um, trying to rig up solutions that don't involve Power Platform because you've not adopted it fully. Yeah. And so, so when you're thinking, I just thought I was thinking of the size of organization that would be adopting this. We're not really talking about the SMB end of the town, right? We're, you know, they're going to be fine probably just with Power Platform. We're talking about more the SMC enterprise space, right, where, one, they would have the affordability potential to, to scale and deal with large data landscapes, which, are, in my experience, I don't see so much of the SMB space. I believe that we're dealing with the SMB as well. Wow. Okay, tell me more. That's what I, I sort of wanted to add there. I believe that the best, I, I believe that the most important feature, you know, of the white paper and of the information shared is the, that flexibility of changing your, you know, changing your thinking. And the reality is that, uh, many, many partners out there, even though they're potentially dealing with enterprise, with big enterprise and like SMCs and, they don't always get that deal, that big deal that would allow them to, uh, you know, go forward with that fabric integration or to set up a, a data landing zone. But the beauty of it is that the five principles of embedding Power Platform into a modern data architecture is that it's a practical tool to help you decide when is your simple integration technique not uh, not appropriate anymore? To give you an example, let's just say that we are connecting an app. Yeah, we are there building an app. It's going to be a model-driven app. And let's say that we're connecting it to an, an access database. We've all been there. Like, of course, you can say, no, I'm not going to deal with such a small project or I'm never going to, you know, I'm looking into big enterprise solutions. But the reality is that whenever we go to conferences and talk to people, a lot of them do have this case scenario as well. So what do they do? Well, using the techniques presented in the white paper, they may say, okay, uh, so I'm going to use a point to point connector to begin with because I only have, because I only need the name of a contact and that's what I'm going to do. But as it is, you might find out that your app is, uh, let's just say a clocking in and up, in and out canvas app. Yeah. Like super simple. You're getting your data from access database initially. And then you're like, oh, okay. I should move it into Dataverse because actually I need it for my HR files, right? So at that point in time, you're like, ah, oh, maybe I should go ahead and do a bit of data consolidation. And you're going to, you know, your second principle of data integration. And then step by step, you can actually evolve into creating a full on data distribution neighborhood. Why not? Even though we are talking about a, you know, an SMB here who purely just wanted an app. If we're doing our job correctly, there's no reason why these principles 
couldn't be applied for big or indeed small projects. I think that Anna's right there. And, and I actually, as, as she was talking, I, there are one of the the beauties of this technology as it, as it sits today and as it has evolved is that, and when I say this technology, right, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of power platform and fabric working side by side. One of the beauties of it is that power platform and fabric make the app plus data story on the one hand, more easily accessible to smaller or less well-resourced organizations that maybe don't have the expertise or don't have the, the, you know, aren't in the financial situation to invest in a big data platform. But at the same time, it makes that same thing highly, highly scalable to organizations that do. As I think about it, actually, you know, we have the, these five these five patterns of integration between Power Platform and Azure Data Services, point-to-point, data consolidation, master data node, data landing zone, and data distribution. I actually think that the two that are most useful in the SMB space are number two and number five. Yep. Number two, data consolidation, because SMBs have an opportunity to really consolidate all of the random spreadsheets that spreadsheets and access databases and trackers, right, that are floating around every business. But they still don't have a huge volume of data. So that mm, allows mm, them mm. to to like do it in two or three sprints, you know, it's like tangible. Exactly. So I think that the an SMB can really quickly get a lot of their data consolidated inside of Dataverse and then start building apps on top of that for, you know, however many people work there, five people, 50 people, yeah, you know, in some some economies, 500 people is still considered SMB, right? So you know, they can do that very quickly. And on the flip side, from a data distribution perspective, an SMB can then take that data from Dataverse, shortcut it into one lake, right? Secure it in one lake and start to perform uh, uh, data distribution type activities, whether it's analytical workloads reporting, whether it's... Um, uh, uh, you know, if you've got the the technical capability there to start augmenting a large language model or to use um, to use your own organizational data in excuse me in the context of of a copilot or or what have you, that uh, the ability to do that now is now more accessible than it has ever been before, even to organizations exactly. that do not have a team of data scientists or exactly. database administrators sitting sitting you know, within their walls. So yeah, I think it's widely applicable across across both enterprise and SMB. And then you take that scenario where you have the concept the concept of a mini startup with, uh, you know, within a big enterprise organization. How many times do those startups actually fail because after they have succeeded, they cannot be integrated within the greater good. They cannot follow the same processes. They cannot, uh, you know, have the same data structures. They cannot afford their leaders the same results. So this is why I believe that the most, the most important thing that can be immediately lifted out of that white paper is the principle of, or is the ability of knowing, uh, okay, when should I make my data integration technique more complex? When is that time? What sort of tool should I use? How much data have I got? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. What knowledge do I have? Yeah. So I tell you what I took away from what you guys just said is that, and particularly, um, you know, for that SMB, who would traditionally probably start with, hey, we've got SharePoint in our M365 and let's put our data in there and let's build our apps over that. What I'm hearing you clearly say is, listen, start with Dataverse, get everything and as in make a choice so that you're only going to use Dataverse because that will give you access to all the other four layers up from the, um, you know, from that level two to the, to, to level five, if you choose to go. But if you're not going to start there, you're going to have to do, you, you, well, one, technical debt you're taking on. Two, you're going to have to change your mind later on, no matter what. So therefore you're going to create a, a higher cost where, 
making that choice from the get-go to start with Dataverse is going to open up your ability to transition up the stack as your organization matures. Do I get that right? Yeah, I believe you've, you've narrowed it down really well. Well, and, and I also think, and it, it, it's funny, it's funny be, you know, given how little time I've spent in the SMB, SMC space, almost all of my work historically has been, has been enterprise. At least all of my customer client facing work has been enterprise. But listen, as, as I think about this, actually, d one of the big objections historically to using Dataverse or one of the big obstacles that organizations have had to overcome has always been a cost obstacle, right? Yeah. And in a weird way, you know, I think that enter big enterprise, you know, if you're a Fortune 100 organization, right, some of the largest global organizations, they can afford wall-to-wall -wall premium power platform licensing, right? Conversely, if you're an SMB, think about what that really means, right? Like wall, even at sticker price, right? So with no Microsoft discounts at all, your annual cost of getting one person a premium power platform license is 240 US dollars, right? If you have 10 employees, you're talking about $2,400 for a whole year of all you can eat power platform, which, you know, I would argue that the productivity gains that an SMB, you know, with say one to 10 people, or even if you extrapolate that out to you start to double that or triple that, right? The productivity gains that an SMB can derive from premium power platform using these approaches and using Dataverse far outstrips the 240 yeah dollars a year, US dollars per year that you're going to spend on the licensing. So I actually think that in a weird way, the the organizations that have the toughest time overcoming the cost hurdle when it comes to premium power platform are the ones, you will call them the SMCs, right? They're the mid-market yes. organizations yeah. that lack the financial resources of the big guys, but yeah. have so much, so many more folks that need the license than the teeny tiny organizations. Yeah. I mean, for, for us at Cloud Lighthouse, and you know, we're business partners, so you know, you guys know this. We've got wall to wall to wall premium power platform and we stick everything in Dataverse. Yeah. It's beyond valuable. It's interesting that mindset because just in the last couple of weeks of I've helped a non for profit get set up on M365 to start with, right? And then of course, with um, Power Apps tailored for them, which somebody in the community, a guy in WA Australia, has gone and built uh, out of the goodness of his heart for this non for profit. And when I, you know, I engaged them because I said, if, you know, I've got intra ID because I wanted to validate where their mail was right before we started. Mm hmm. Uh, it was an old friend who I hadn't seen for years, and so I didn't know how they were running their charity. It's, it's a, you know, it's a successful charity and what they're doing in the community. And I was like, oh, listen, and like he came to my house for the day, and within a few hours, I migrated his email domain, everything onto M365, spun that up, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, did he get non-for-profit licensing? But like at the end of the day, the cost for one year for the number of staff they had was absolutely negligible. And I think there's this perception that, oh, it's Microsoft that's costly. For startup, what you get bang for buck, as you say, is absolutely incredible and a no-brainer. Because what I did notice is that after he left my place, I haven't heard from him since. And, like, that's a positive thing. That means yeah. everything's working, right? It's yes. just worked. And I just, yeah. oh, you know, in the old days where you'd set up your Apache server and your you know, SMTP servers and POP servers and stuff. And it's just like, you'd hold your, you know, breath that it all work right. And I had not put myself in that headspace where I see so many startups go, oh, we're going to get a, a Google suite because it's cheap or free. And I'm like, mm, do you understand what you get out of the box with the Microsoft um, in that respect? And and as you say, with Dataverse, you're right about the mid-market being the, the toughest space um, from a scaling perspective. So what I'd like to know is that I know that at the Brussels conference, and forgive me for not saying the name because I can never remember how many letters and acronyms there are. What was it? 
<laughs> EPPC, EPPC. EPPC, the European Power Platform Conference, I think, <laughs> EPPC. Fantastic. I plan to be there next year. But that aside, um, I saw the photos of the session, and they were pretty much down the hallway. The room was absolutely jam-packed. I think about 3,000 people in the room plus what flowed out the door. <laughs> now, tell me, what's been the response? As you've shared this message, what's been the response? The metrics on this, uh, and I'm going to get this almost right, I think that we had – so the timeline here was that we presented – we presented the white paper at Dynamics Minds and we shared it with those who attended Dynamics Minds. We then only two weeks later had EPPC in Brussels where we presented the the session, the topics again. And we did, I mean, we, we had probably 300 people in that room, They people flowing out the door. Um, and it was a wild room too. It looked like a room where a parliamentary committee would meet. And it was, I, 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 I think I said at the beginning of the session that I always imagined that if I ever spoke on the floor of a room like that, it was going to be in order to get a law passed. But no, 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 we were presenting on power platform <laughs> in a modern data platform architecture. And it was on that day, the day of the session was when we released the the paper and, and posted about it and, and shared it. I think the numbers are that we had over 500 downloads of the white paper in 24 hours. We had m just dozens and dozens of reshares of the content. I spent several hours just replying to comments on comments and questions on, on LinkedIn. So I would say it was probably the excuse me, single most popular piece of content that I had ever produced, um, at least in its uptake within the first 24 hours. So it's very clear to me that there's a lot of demand for uh, the idea of how do we make Power Platform work with the rest of our data platform? How do we use Power Platform with our organizational data? And going the other way, how do we use Power Platform? If I'm a data platform owner, how do I use Power Platform and take advantage of this Microsoft technology that I might not be totally familiar with to really drive the data platform deeper into the daily work of my colleagues Um you know, and, and, and the people that I work with. So the, the response has been phenomenal. And I, I will call out and say that, you know, this white paper was written, I wrote this very, very much, like very collaboratively with with Microsoft. Um so so this had this had eyes on it from from folks that you know folks that actually built this technology. So it, it it's been really great. Yeah. So so we've obviously been inundated with one the people downloading it, and of course, the spinoff is from that has been that a lot of people are asking, "We want more. Like, can we can we um, partner with Cloud Lighthouse in our own customers? Can you guys come in and run sessions with our clients in a partner situation?" And then, of course, we've had end customers coming to us and asking about practically how do we do this for our organization, right? And and yeah. it opens doors for us to, of course come in, run workshops. And so it doesn't matter where you're located in the world. If this is something that you want to do the one or two first kind of, uh, let's call it hand-holding with us, we, you know, particularly Andrew has a service here that allows you to get in touch with us. We, and that's whether you're a Microsoft partner already or an end customer. And we can actually bring this to life in the context of your data estate your plans. We can work with your um, enterprise architect group and really get that blueprint in place and a roadmap for your organization in context of this. Andrew, what are you finding from you know the people that we've, you've, you've already particularly started doing this for? What are you seeing? Yeah, well, so this, this goes back to, and, and something you said a moment ago about enterprise architects. So we've talked a lot on on this on this show before about the need to bring enterprise architects on board with this idea of ecosystem oriented architecture, which mm. I think by in the Microsoft space by definition involves power platform, fabric, Azure, data and infrastructure and security services, etc. So I think that we are one thing I'm really pleased about over the last you know four or five months or so is I think that we've done a good job 
And I'm starting to see more and more folks do this. So I'm thinking Carl Cookson, for example, launched a blog that, you know, he's, he's producing really good, deep content about this, but it's really designed to help enterprise architects get on board with and give the thumbs up to the CIO in their organization that, yeah, this, this approach is, is legitimate, it's robust, it's scalable, and, and it's going to pay dividends for us. So the first thing that I'm, I'm seeing as I'm now, you know, I've got a number of, of, of workshops coming up where I'm, I'm taking on this topic, right, and helping organizations build their uh, data strategy and, and, and architect, architect to make that data strategy actionable. The, the first and foremost thing that I'm seeing is a growing acceptance among enterprise architects that these types of approaches are the right way to go. We had a, a question, actually, when we did our last episode of the show, we had a, a we did a, a listener Q&A. So if you haven't seen that episode, go go listen. But one of the really good questions was something to the effect of, I'm a I'm a an ERP architect. I've spent a lot of time with Dynamics F and O. I want to. I need to start building uh, ecosystem oriented architectures. How do I do that? How do I get started? And what the thing that delighted me about that question, right, is that I feel like, at least in my experience, the ERP architects are always the most skeptical. All right, are are often the most difficult to convince that there's a new or a different way of doing things. So it heartened me to hear that question coming from an ERP architect. But I also think that, you know, we're we're just creating momentum and we're creating the material and the patterns and the reference architectures to back that up. We're just creating such good momentum around ecosystem oriented architecture, which is, you know, I think, you know, I Anna and I definitely believe this is the this is the future for most uh, for most organizations of any size. I would add that this also um, aids those organizations with, um, you know, traditional divisions of, um, I don't know, database engineers and then, uh, you know, developers. And it gives these people a door to open towards ecosystem architecture as well. In fact, a lot of the audience that we've had in, in Brussels was not Power Platform. They were .NET developers wanting to, yeah. you know, wanting to see, okay, so what do we do now? How does a system look like, you know, nowadays? And how does it all integrate together? Because, you know, the same question comes up over and over and over again. Dataverse is the most expensive database in the world. Why are you guys using it? And the fact that it sparks, uh, you know, curiosity and this question in those people's minds is really important because many organizations are still battling with creating a DevOps type you know, strategy, environment, culture, where everybody collaborates and works together, where we're finding the right solution for the problem, not the right solution that we know will work because we've tried it before and because it's the technology that we know, et cetera, et cetera. So I believe this is what makes the white paper so damn successful. It's because it doesn't just talk about the app and the power platform developers. It yeah reaches everybody. I like it. Let me ask you a question, Anna. So one one thing that we've not we've talked we've talked about enterprise, we've talked about SMB, we've talked about you know, we've talked about individual technologists. So we've been very through this conversation very sure. focused on you know on those folks. But we haven't talked a lot about Microsoft partners, which are, you know, obviously such an important part of this equation. Yeah. So let me ask you and I, I have my opinions, but how do you believe Microsoft implementation partners and consultancies should be taking the concepts in power platform and a modern data platform architecture and making them real in their own work. What are your thoughts? I mean, I think they should at least start, Andrew. I, I'm still seeing, <laughs> I'm still seeing opinions of, and even, um, the the what I thought was surely long dead lift and shift strategy 
I mean, it, it's a cry for help. Partners have to have to start doing this because their customers are going to are going to request it. My customers are requesting it. Like yeah. I, mm -hmm. and my customers are government institutions or uh, public safety and national security. And you would think that they're, you know, stuck in the past and old fashioned and like in their jobs for like 20 years or more. And whilst they may be that, they're also asking the right questions. So customers are going to start asking the right questions. How do I integrate X with Y? How do I make my data secure? And at the same time, by the way, I want to use Copilot. Mm -hmm. So yeah. partners are going to have to stop writing, you know, proposals that start with, we're just going to model the tables in data verse like your Excel spreadsheet is. No. Yeah. Hardly. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Mark? Um, I think I'd like to hear what you think. And the reason I'm saying that is that as, as in we're, we're at time. Because I wrote the damn thing. We're, we're at time. So um, I, as in I don't want to go on too much longer. But it's interesting what you said there, Anna, is that I think, Andrew, um, there is room for another white paper to be written directly aimed at Microsoft partners and how – you know, the partner of the future really is going to need to to operate in a new way because I think things are changing so rapidly. And I think that the end customer is becoming so much more mature and their expectations mm -hmm. are going so much higher that the traditional partner is not delivering. And, you know, I wrote that post a few weeks ago, which has been my most successful LinkedIn post of all time around the, the Microsoft partner is dead. And I think, and of course, it was tongue in cheek, absolutely. And I, I didn't specify what partner sizing, but I think there's a pivot to a new type of partner. And I think, as I say, Andrew, there needs to be almost a white paper around this. And of course, you're so good at writing these things to really go, because what are the questions came out? So what's next? So what do you do? How do you pivot? What? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the last 24 hours, I've done multiple meetings with people in the UK that are um, fit these profiles. One, new boutique partners starting up that are going, you know, we we want to set ourselves on the right trajectory. We just don't want to become a, a, a traditional partner as we scale. And the second one is where I'm seeing in customers, and this is another conversation I've had in the last 24 hours, um, one of the largest, I won't say actually their industry in the United Kingdom, but it's uh, it's a very large player over there, that are moving away from their partner that they've been with for seven years and bringing the whole operation in-house around their data estate, around app building, around the services wow. they will offer to their constituent, their customer base, their clients, and then also making the IP that they develop available to their peers in the same industry. And I'm seeing that pivot, you know, as a lot of people are like, customers will never be able to do this for themselves they need a partner and once again it just reinforced that you're getting in customers going you know what we'll run our own practice and why were they reaching out to us is because they want help on that journey of getting that structure in place and and you know one of their workloads is a major uh, on-premise lift to the cloud and they want to do yeah. it right. They don't want to just do a lift and shift and same thing in a different, you know, location yeah. from their data perspective. But they want to go, okay, how are we um, readying our organization for the future where we know the IT landscape alone is going to go through a massive monumental shift over the next five years? They don't want to just do business as they've been doing business because it's not preparing their company for the future. So, yeah, take up that challenge, Andrew. White paper, please. <laughs> uh, it's almost like we discussed it before. But um, the the only other thing that I'll add, and I and, and then then we can 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 wrap this up because I know we're at time. But is that I would love to see some Microsoft partners take the paper and look at some of the patterns. I'm thinking specifically patterns three and four. So master mm -hmm. data node and data and landing zone, zone and develop IP that makes those sorts of relatively complex architectures 
to make that those architectures more accessible and to make yeah. them more robust, more scalable. More I would love a exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that's my yeah, yeah. challenge to, to partners is to build some IP that that makes yeah. this uh, makes this more accessible. I think I think you have a winner there if you do that. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody. Um, please reach out. Hit us up on the LinkedIn posts, the X posts when we when we publish us. Um, go to cloudlight.house and check us out. Get in touch. If we can help you, we want to help you. We're, uh, we're not implementation partners. Um, we will come along. We'll, we'll have your strategy. Um, but thanks, guys, for joining from your all of us from our remote locations today. Thanks. Thanks, guys. See you. Bye.